Amen. Go ahead, if you will, and take your Bibles out. We're actually going to be in, uh, in a number of passages today. It's, it's normally we, we teach here verse by verse out of a book of the Bible. Uh, we have actually uh, stopped our Judges series just long enough to get through the first part of the year where we focus on some topical sermons, and we'll come back to Judges right after Easter. But uh, today I want to focus us through our series that we're in. It's a series that we've been in now for four weeks. It's called Created to Worship. And uh, it's an exciting series. It's an opportunity for us to really grow in understanding what it means to be an authentic believer. And an authentic believer is a worshiper. Worship is not something we do. It's who you are. You are a worshiper of God. And so that's the title of our series, Created to Worship. It's, it, interestingly enough, it, it happens when a person is regenerated. We just sang about being in Christ, not I, but Christ in me. And the fact is when you're saved, you are regenerated. Before you're saved, you have a dead spirit. You have an unregenerate spirit. You're not able to worship God. We're going to look at a passage in just a moment and better understand that. But once you come to Christ, you believe upon him, you confess your sin, you are transformed by God, not by yourself, not by, you know, the way you think, not by the power within you, but by Christ alone, you are transformed into a new life. And in that new life, you now have the capacity by the Holy Spirit to worship the one true living God. And so that's an awesome thought when you think about it, right? This morning, I want to do something. I, you know, we've, we've hit several different uh, uh, focuses in this series that really help us focus on our identity as Christians. And we'll talk about those three weeks that we've already had, and then we'll talk about today. But before I do that, I want to lay out exactly where we're going so you know where we're heading this morning. The first thing I want to do is talk about the identity that we have in Christ. Then we're going to focus on humility. Humility, because humility is the one virtue by which all other Christian virtues flow. And today the focus is created to serve God. Serving God is not what you do. Serving God begins as a worshiper. You just worship God back. He's loved you, he's poured out Uh, his son's blood on the cross that you might be forgiven so that your response is to now serve him. Some people see serving as a duty. It's not a duty. It's an act of worship. And so we'll connect the dots with humility, and then lastly, we'll just close it out with some thoughts about serving with a spirit of humility. So let's begin with prayer. Father, as we get into the word today, may the word come alive for us. May I pray every person here be able to experience your love, your joy, your peace, your comfort, your encouragement, your exhortation, your correction. Lord, whatever it takes for us to move further in this new life that we have in Christ, that's our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in John chapter 4, you, we're going to have scriptures up on the screen so you can follow if you'd like, but I'm going to keep moving through this message. In John chapter 4, verse 19 through 26, Jesus lovingly confronts a Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob, and uh, he has confronted her lovingly over the fact that she has had five husbands, and she's now living with another man. Do not think for a second that the Jesus of the Bible only comes with grace. He also comes with truth. John foretells that in the Gospel of John chapter 1, that he came in grace and truth. And so he lovingly confronts her about these things, and she responds. And if you look with me at verse 19, it says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. There's no other way that you would have known about my past marital status, but you know it, so you must be a prophet. She said, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. 
And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Verse 22, look closely. You worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. We, speaking of the Jews, we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So Jesus is telling her that up to this point in time, you've worshiped on the wrong wrong place. The Jews have had it right. You worship in Jerusalem. But now a time's coming and is now here when it won't be on that mountain or in Jerusalem. Now we will all worship God in spirit and truth. And those are the types of people that God is seeking. Those who worship him in spirit and in truth. The verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. She doesn't realize it. Jesus just told her all things. And then he says this, and there are those who say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. Well, Jesus did claim this. He said to her, I who speak to you am he. Well, who did she say was coming? Messiah. He's saying, I am Messiah. I am the Christos, the anointed one. I am the one sent from God to set people free of their sins. So here's the takeaway on this little passage quickly. Many worship what they do not know, and that's the truth today. Many people worship what they do not know. True salvation comes from Messiah. It comes from Messiah. The Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and truth. When you come to know Jesus Christ as Messiah, when you come to know him as the Son of God who died on the cross, who paid the price for your sin, the sins that you've committed, and he took on your your sinfulness in order to give you his righteousness so that you could stand before God, seen by the Father, in perspective of the Father, as righteous. Justification by faith just as if you never sinned. That's how your father sees you today if you are born again, if you've been saved, if you've come to Christ on his terms of peace. And that's exactly what she's speaking of here. She is seeing for the first time that Messiah has come. And of course, this woman gets saved on the spot. I pray that today in this place, because of just that simple little word from the Bible, you will be saved today. You will surrender your heart, confess your sin, believe upon Jesus as Messiah, and be saved. When you are born again, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit, you now have the capacity to worship the Father in spirit and truth. Understand, the series is created to worship. Today is created to worship through serving. You have to have the Holy Spirit in you. You have to be saved in order to worship God by serving Many people are religious, and they serve as religious people, but they're not worshiping God because their spirit has not been regenerated. Their spirit's not been made alive so that they, as a spirit being, can worship God who is a spirit. So now what they're doing is out of their flesh, they're trying to appease God by serving him. You cannot appease God by serving him. All the appeasement that God needed was done through Christ on the cross. Jesus is the one who satisfied God's sin debt over mankind. And so it's important that we understand this. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has regenerated you. You're a different person now. You're not the same person. Don't approach worship the same way that you did when you were just a religious person. It's different now. God's done a new work in your heart. Salvation is the work of God. By the way, it's it's all the work of God. All salvation is the work of God. From beginning to end, you do nothing to save yourself, okay? Romans chapter 10. Turn with me because I want you to see this. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. Are you hanging, church? Are Are you with me this morning? All right, good. It's good to be in the Word, isn't it? Romans 10, verse 8. The Apostle Paul gives a strong word here. 
hey, Doug, he's one of our elders. Doug, would you bring me a, a water, a bottle of water? Thank you. I'm going to need that because I got a feeling I'm going to get stirred up in this. I just see it coming, man. I just, I, this is just such an exciting passage. This whole message, I'm just pumped up about it. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. The word of faith is in you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Because, here's why, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess and believe. For with the heart one believes and is justified by God. Justification by faith. Justification by believing. That's how you're justified in the eyes of God. Not by serving, not by doing. You're solely justified in the eyes of God by believing in Jesus as the Messiah. And with the mouth one confessed or confesses and is saved. So once you believe, let people know it. You don't hide it. God has saved me. Through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, I'm a saved person. I'm no longer the same person. Let people know that. Verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. It doesn't matter who you are. If you call upon the name of the Lord, God will save you. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? You've got to believe to be saved, right? And how will, are they to be, believe in him of whom they have not heard? You've got to believe to be saved. You've got to hear the message of, God, of the gospel to believe. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent by God? Today, preaching is looked down upon. People will say, oh, don't preach at me. Don't preach at me. Maybe you hear that in the workplace. The boss gets up and gives the philosophy of the, ah, oh, you're preaching again. Stop preaching. Hey, Bible says we need preaching. We need the preaching of the word of God. Preach the word, the Bible says. And so here it says, how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good. Friends, I've got beautiful feet today because I'm standing before you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every time you open your mouth and you share the gospel of Christ with others, you have beautiful feet. God looks at you and says, I don't care how stinky smelly your spouse says your feet are. They're beautiful feet when you're sharing the gospel. Amen. All right. We simply confess sin and believe in the work that Jesus did on the cross for our sins. Salvation is such an organic experience, not predicated upon what you do or what you've earned. It's simply a position of surrender. That's all God wants from you for salvation to occur is you surrender. Just give up. Stop, being your, stop trying to be you. Stop trying to make it happen. Stop trying to think that you have a better plan than God and trying to make life work on your own. Stop it. Just surrender. Throw your arms up. Lord, I believe Jesus is Messiah. I confess my sin and I speak it out. I'm going to let you know and I'm going to let others know that Jesus is my Savior. Amen. You're saved. See, God transforms your being. You're no longer the same person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. See, the whole act of salvation is God's work. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And let me just say this. When somebody gets saved, one person gets saved and they cry like a little baby. They're just so overwhelmed by the fact that God would forgive them of their sins because they've committed some sins that they're just so, so sorry for. That, that's fine. They're, they're, that's wonderful when people come and they emotionally they just explode because they're just so overjoyed for what God has Other There's other people. They, they never shed a tear. But from their heart, they believe and they confess, and they are saved. Salvation is not predicated by some kind of an emotional response. It's predicated by what you know in the gospel. And so don't measure people by how they respond. You don't know how they respond because you don't know their heart. Amen? 
One of the tactics of Satan is to take, though, this is a, here's the thing, and I, I, I want to go here. Let's kind of shift gears now, and let's just look a little bit at uh, where we've been and where we're going. Uh, but this whole idea that you have now the Holy Spirit dwelling within you as a worshiper of God, that is a game changer. That's a game changer. Everything you do now is different. It's not done with other motives, wrong motives. It's done simply as a worshiper of God, okay? One of the tactics of Satan is to keep us from understanding our new identity in Jesus Christ. When you, when you come to Christ, you're no longer the same person. We just read it. There's a new identity. Some of you don't even know your new identity. You don't even know who you are. You know, you're saved, but that's it. You need to understand the identity God's given you. And I'm going to hit several of those. We've been hitting them each week. But it's real important. God has set you free to live as a worshiper before him. You were created for this. But, but to do so, we have to know who we are. And at the root of your identity in Christ is the fact that you were created to worship. That's the foundation. That's the beginning point. That's what's, and when you get up in the morning, it's to worship God. When you lay your head at night, you're thanking God that you could worship him all day. Now, Lord, through the night, Lord, let me just sleep with peace so that I can get up in the morning and worship you some more. That's what life is about. When you t- lay your head on your death pillow, you want to thank God that you, were, you lived on this earth as a worshiper. It's the greatest thing about you, okay? A worshiper of God. And so three weeks ago, we focused on the truth that we were created to commune with God. That means that we have the capacity by the Holy Spirit living in us to pray. I can now have a relationship with God. That is not a religious experience. That's not a re- lot of people pray. Different religions, they pray. But in Christianity, in true Christianity, prayer is an act of worship. I'm literally communing. I'm having fellowship with God through prayer because Christ is in me. Amen? Then then two weeks ago, we learned something about our identity, that we were created to grow in our knowledge of God, that God has given us the capacity to understand his word. Before you're saved, it doesn't make sense. Before you're saved, you come to church, maybe you're not saved, you're here today. And so you're hearing all this, you're going to hear a sermon, and then you're going to leave, and you're going to be on your way to lunch and on the way, you're going to say, I didn't, I, what, what, what was that about? I didn't understand a single thing he was saying. What was he talking about? Maybe that's what you're feeling right now. I, I don't get it. I don't, what are you talking about? Because the Holy Spirit has not revealed it to you. And when you're saved, the Holy Spirit's now in you. He's able to give you illumination, understanding of the things of the Spirit, the things that are in the Bible. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians. We'll spend just a moment here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Is this helping anyone? These are foundational things that we're talking about this morning. But I think some of us have been in the faith long enough that we've kind of picked up habits, and not all of them are good. And we just take for granted the fact that we're saved. But we don't think about what has been afforded us as believers of Jesus Christ, that we are now worshipers of God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 <clears throat> says, But it is, as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, on that face value alone, people think that's speaking of heaven. It is not. This whole passage is not about heaven. None of it's about heaven. Okay, look at verse 10. These things, what things? The things that God's prepared for us. God has revealed to us through the Spirit I don't know, but God's not revealed heaven to me by the Spirit. Now, I know what heaven is from the Bible, but I don't know, there's nothing else that I know yet. I've not been there. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. This passage is is really hitting on the wisdom that you and I need in order to understand the vastness of God's resources that he's made available to us. This passage is all about how much God loves you, and that when you study his word, he's given you the Holy Spirit that you might be able to understand what you're reading and come into a greater life in Christ, practicing, living out what you know to be true in the Bible. This is powerful to me. The wisdom that saves is a wisdom that cannot know. It, cannot, it can only be known by God 
when he reveals it to man. God makes no, uh, no he, he's not allowing you to figure it out on your own. If you're unregenerate, you can't get it. And if you're saved, you still might not get it if you're not open to letting the Spirit reveal it to you. Some of us approach the Bible, well, I like these things, I don't like these things. So therefore, there's pages in your Bible that have never been opened because you don't want to look at those pages. You don't like what they say. You're not open to the Spirit. You're grieving the Holy Spirit when you do that. So you have to open yourself to the Lord for him to reveal. And what does he reveal? Here it is. He gives revelation, he gives inspiration, and he gives illumination. He gives revelation and inspiration. He gave that to those who wrote the Bible. Now you have God's full disclosure of himself. You have what you need to go through this life right here, right now. This is it. This is what God's given you. And now he gives you illumination to understand it by the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who moves certain men to write books of the Bible under inspiration and revelation, now he gives you inspiration to understand, or illumination to understand it. You get to understand it. That's why Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. You should be growing. Because you're a worshiper, you are created to grow. You're created to be a student of the word to love the Bible. That's what you were created for as a believer, to love this, to love this more than what the, the, uh, the, the celebrities say about the Bible, to love this more than what the History Channel says about the Bible, to love this more than what others have written about the Bible. You love this. You want to study this. You want to know this because in this is the Life that transforms. Amen? Now look down further at verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 2. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So he's continuing to tell you, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it been put in the heart of man, what God has made available through the spirit to those who love him. You. Verse 13, and we impart, we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Only somebody who's saved has the capacity to understand spiritual truth. Look at verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. For he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. A natural person who's not been regenerated in their spirit uh, to, to be saved, they just can't get it. They read the same thing you read, and they're, they're thinking, man, that makes no sense at all. You're an idiot for thinking that, that you, that you believe that. And you're like, you don't, why don't you see it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says Satan has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving. To believe or to, to receive the word, you have to believe in God. And the Bible says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. And so you've opened yourself to say, no, there is a God. His name is Jesus. Messiah has come. And I've received him by his work on the cross. And because of that, I'm saved. And now the Holy Spirit lives in me, and I'm able to interpret and understand the Bible by the Holy Spirit. A person who's not gone through that process that God's given, they can't get it. In fact, he goes further, and he says, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? To the, who can instruct the Christian? Nobody can except the Lord himself. But we have the mind of Christ. That's why we don't need somebody else's instruction. We have the mind of Christ. We have the Bible. I don't need somebody to tell me about God when it's stuff they're telling me that's not in the Bible. I, I have the Bible. This is my rule of faith right here, right? So last week, let's, let's go ahead and move forward. Last week, we learned that we were created to, to be God's ambassadors to the world, sharing the gospel. By the way, uh, Pastor Ray preached a great sermon on the Word of God two weeks ago. And last week, uh, one of our elders, Marshall Pennell, preached a great message on the Great Commandment, or the Great Commission, rather, and what a great message it was, that we are to share the gospel with others. Amen? Well, why? Why, why should we do that? Because that's our identity. What's our identity? to be witnesses to the world that Jesus Christ is the, is the Son of God. 
He said, if you'll stay here in Jerusalem, tarry a little longer, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will not do witnessing. You will be witnesses. That's who you are. You just share wherever you go. Amen. Go to the restaurant, tell the lady that's bringing the food, hey, God loves you. We're going to pray for our food. Anything we can pray for you. And she's going to look at you like, what, what? You're going to pray for me? Yeah, we would like to pray for you. You you have a need in your life? I sure do. You're witnessing. You're pointing her to the fact that there is a God that you can pray to about problems. Amen? That's good stuff. Everybody here can do that. Amen? That's weak, man. That is so weak. (laughs) You cannot do that after hearing the truth of the word. Amen? That's right. That's who we are. Okay. Now, let's get to this week. I haven't even started. No, I have started. But some of you are getting really nervous right now. You know, the pragmatics in the room are just going like, what, what, man? It's what time it is? Are you kidding me? Okay, this week, we turned our focus to understand how we've been created to serve God and one, and one another with our gifts. So it's about serving. However, first, before we can go there, it needs to be said that if Satan cannot get us to stop serving the Lord in a God-honoring way, then he will try to get us to serve the Lord in a God-forbidden way. And the God-forbidden way is to serve him out of your own strength. To take a a position of service. You look around the room, today is a day, it's a ministry fair. We've set up all the ministries of our church on tables around the room. And at the close, you're going to have time. Take a good 10, 15 minutes and just walk to each table. And that way you know how to pray for them. But maybe God's drawing you to a ministry to serve in. But here's the deal. You don't want to serve if it's out of your flesh to be seen, to appease God. Well, I'm doing this because I know it will make God happy. God's already happy. The fact that you're saved, that's all that God, that's, that's awesome. You serve because you want to worship him back. And so Satan's out to try to destroy that. He wants you to worship in the wrong, or serve in the wrong way for the wrong reason. Serving should never be a self-exalting, ego-driven head trip. It's a Christ-centered, God-exalting, loving people act of humility. And that's where I want to go with this. What we're talking about from this point forward in the sermon, I'm not going to just tell you all about serving and what it means to serve and how to serve. and all. I want to talk to you about the prerequisite for serving. Because if you can get this right then your attitude and your heart will be right as you serve. So let's just deal with the foundational stuff, and that is we're going to talk about gospel humility. Write it down. Gospel humility. This one Christian virtue feeds all other virtues of Christ. To get a right understanding of serving the Lord as an act of worship, we first need to be consumed and saturated in gospel humility. Some of us are very strong in the Bible. We know the word of God, but we're weak in gospel humility. And so therefore, when we speak, when we act, when we do, when we serve, a lot of times it comes out of our own ego. It comes out of what we think we are and not so much who God is because there's no gospel humility leading us. I can tell you this. I personally long for gospel humility. As I preach this morning, I want to preach this message from gospel humility. I I want to work alongside a group of elders at Vero Bible Fellowship who walk in, who long for gospel humility. That as we love on people and pray for people and care for people, as we teach the Bible, we do it out of gospel humility. I want to be part of a family of God where the people come with a hunger to learn from God from a foundation of gospel humility. That you're here for the right reason. We want to be marked by a gospel humility that only desires to lift up the one name that really matters. That is the name of Jesus. It's interesting that Jesus, who was the most humble person that walked the earth, was tortured to death because he was accused of blasphemous arrogance. You don't believe it? 
John chapter 5, verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. They saw that as blasphemous and arrogant, and he was God. He's walking in humility the whole time he's on the earth, and they're perceiving it as prideful and arrogant. And the same will happen to you. If you walk in gospel humility and you serve the Lord with a right heart, there will be some who will still accuse you of arrogance. Egotistical. It's all about you. It's not about you. So just know. So don't not do it because what people will say. It doesn't matter what people say. You're, you, just, you just hunger for gospel humility. Okay? So here we are. What are the traits of humility found in Scripture? Because I really want us to think about how can my service to God exhibit true, humil- hu- true humility, which really is the antithesis of pride, right? So what are the traits of humility found in Scripture? There's six of them. Number one, humility gives God the credit. Humility gives God the credit. The passage is 1 Corinthians 1.26. It's the, past, the passage that Kathleen read for us as we started this morning. Humility gives God the credit. Number one, I want you to see this. Verse, verse 26 of chapter 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Look, God's not looking for perfect people. He's not looking for people who think they're wonderful. He's not looking for people who other people say are wonderful. God is looking for people who have gospel humility. Maybe you are incredibly gifted. You're a 10 in that particular gift. Okay, great, but don't treat yourself. Don't think of yourself as a 10. Without Christ, you can do nothing. We'll look at that in just a moment. This gospel humility is so important. Look at verse 30. And because of him, you are, in, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Everything you have, everything you possess, your wit, your ability, your reasoning, your skills, your talent, your money, your reputation, your good standing in the community, listen, all of it is from the Lord. That's gospel humility. You recognize that. You live your life out of that. That's what it means to be a worshiper of God and serving others and serving God, is that you do it out of gospel humility. The point is that humility agrees. Humility is glad that God gets all the credit for choosing, choosing you and calling you according to his purpose and not calling you according to your merit. God, listen, the humility spirit says, oh, it's wonderful that God did all that. See, some of you struggle with that because you've been to too many, whatever that guy's name is, the, 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 the Robin, Tony Robbins, thank you. You've been to too many Tony Robbins conferences. It's within you. You've watched Oprah Winfrey way too much. That's not the answer. It's not within you. The Whitney Houston song, you know, the greatest love of all. She missed it. She missed it. It's Christ in you. That is your only hope. Amen? Humility gives God the credit. Secondly, humility recognizes the gifts of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. We'll just read it, just a couple verses. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul said, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You think it's yours? I remember uh, 
attending a, a revival service back when I was a boy. And uh, they had gotten word, the, the, the music director that night was so excited because he had contacted Bill Gaither, and Bill Gaither gave permission for a new song that he just came out with that hadn't been released yet called, I'm So Glad I'm a Part of the Family of God. And he's going to let us sing this song. He gave us permission. And everybody was, woo! And then the speaker got up. And the speaker started and said, it's just interesting to me that we had to get permission from Bill Gaither to sing a a song that God gave him for free. It's so easy for us to lay claim, isn't it? Every one of us. Humility recognizes the gifts of God. They're God's gifts. Humility agrees, and it's glad that everything we have is a free gift of God, that it severs the root of boasting in our distinctiveness. Whatever talents, whatever intelligence, whatever skills, whatever gifts, whatever looks, whatever pedigree, possessions, charisma, Whatever influence you think you have, put away that stuff. It's all pride. Because really, it's just a gift of God that you have it. (laughs) Put it all away. If you don't put it away, then if you don't have it, you'll just be in despair. Either way, you think you're something or you think you're nothing. You lose either way. Just know that all things come from God. Thirdly, humility acknowledges God's providence. James chapter 4, verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or do that. Listen, as it is written, You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it's sin. What you should do is just when whatever happens, know that God is sovereign. God's in God's providence. He's ordered up your life. Stop trying to act like you're the one making it happen. You're not the one making it happen. You want to figure out what God's up to in your life and join him in it. That's the answer. It's not you creating something for God. Like you're going to come in, Lord, okay, here's, here's, we're going to have some prayer time, Lord, and here's, here's, what, here's what I want to do. This is what I believe. The Bible says that you know, people are perishing for lack of knowledge and, and also that where there is no vision, you know, the people perish. Uh, no, it's not your vision. It's God's vision. Where God's vision has not been revealed by the leader, the people perish. I used to say it this way. Where there is no God vision, there's no people in the parish. People don't want to follow a man. You want to follow God. Amen? And so you want to make sure that you are walking in the Lord. Listen, humility agrees and is glad that God governs our days, that God gives you safe travel from here to there. And if you get there, you got there because of God. And if you don't get there, it's not a surprise to God. He's still in control. There must be something else he's working in you and in others. Just go with it. Rini and I spent uh, Friday and Saturday in New Smyrna uh, with her father who has Alzheimer's. And so he's struggling. And so we gave the care because her mother had to have a gallbladder surgery. And then she recuperated at one of Rini's sister's houses in town. And so we stayed with her father and just spent that time with him. And it 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 was tough tough for her to see her dad in that condition and have to and then it was constant caregiving to him constant caregiving and loving him where he is look i why would god order that up for anybody i don't know why did god make isaac lie 11 years bedridden one of the patriarchs of the faith because the sun rises on this on the just and the unjust alike god's not going to treat you any better than anybody else And there's lessons that God wants to teach you when you go through those things. I came out of yesterday and the day before so thankful for the privilege of serving my father-in-law, who's been a great man of God to me through the years, who served this country faithfully, who was a great dad. And now I have an opportunity to give back to him. And I'm thanking God 
for that experience the last 48 hours. See, it's God that we give thanks to. Amen? He gets all the glory. Even in the tough stuff, give God the glory. Number four, humility cherishes the gospel. Colossians 3.12, humility cherishes the gospel. In Colossians, it says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. One of the implications, church, of this text is that our humble willingness to forgive others of their offense is rooted in God's forgiveness. In other words, Christian humility is rooted in in the gospel. True humility is gospel humility. It's not just copying Jesus and his willingness to die for others. It's enabled by Jesus because he died for us. So knowing what Christ has done for me out of this spirit of humility, gospel humility, I serve others. I help others. I give to others because of the recognition, the acknowledgement in my heart that the gospel has changed me. That's why I do it. It's the gospel. Amen? Number five, humility serves others. It serves others. Philippians chapter two. This is a great passage. I want you to turn, if you will, please. Philippians two. We're closing it down. Don't worry. The pragmatist can can rest. We're, we're, We're almost done. Humility serves others. Philippians chapter two, verse three. Paul said, speaking of Jesus Christ, He said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That is a sermon that could preach for the whole year right there. Let me say it again. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. When you serve the Lord as an act of worship, that's how you approach it right there. Verse 1, or verse verse 3. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. I'm not going to speak for other churches, and I think the other churches are successful, and maybe God's even ordered it up for them. But he hasn't for us, and and I'll tell you why. Biblically, I struggle with having a worship service for young people. I struggle for having a worship service for old people. I struggle for designing and catering to any age group or any color or any differences that we might have. I believe that this passage says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more important than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I think in this country that we're in, North America, that, com- that, that capitalism component can enter into the life of the church. And while I, while I agree with capitalism, in our government and in our system, I don't agree with it in the life of the church. I don't believe that we should cater a service to certain com- consumers' needs. We should all learn to get along with each other. That is the beauty of the church in Ephesus, made up of all kinds of people. These people would have never came together and worshipped together. They would have never come together for any reason. Nothing was attractive to them to come together except Jesus Christ saved them from their sins. What they had in common was one thing, the gospel. And they became a community of believers because of the gospel. You lay down all these personal preferences. You look to help others rather than help yourself. It's not about you sitting at the table. It's about looking around the table to see who needs some more food. Amen? See the difference, the perspective? Humility serves others. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Humility, listen, humility measures everything it does by whether it serves the good of the people, of other people. And I am feeding my, am I, am I feeding my ego or am I going to feed the faith of others? See, a happy servant of God who walks in gospel humility is excited to feed others, not himself. He will feed himself from the word. He will feed himself from his or her Bible study group. He will feed himself through fellowship of other believers. But he, when he serves out of that gifting, he will serve for the purpose of others alone. It's a beautiful thing. 
Number six, last point. Humility knows greatness. Humility knows greatness. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus called them to, to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. I do not want anyone in my church lording or holding authority over others. I want to say this to you. I've said it here so many times since we started a little over a year ago as a fellowship. And I want to say it again. That I do not have any authority over you except when I stand behind a pulpit and deliver to you the word of God. This comes with authority. And I am to proclaim it authoritatively. When I step out of the pulpit, I do not have authority over you. I am one of you. The Lord does not want anyone to lord over. But here's what he wants from me and from you and everybody here. Listen. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. The lower you go, the higher you are in the eyes of God. The lower you go, the higher you are to God. So stop trying to make people recognize you for what you do. People who serve and after a year, well, nobody's talked about my, my, my ministry. Nobody, nobody's, nobody's, said, nobody's invited me to come up and give a testimony. There's been no announcement made about my ministry. You should be thankful that all the glory is going to God and God is storing up for you treasures in heaven, a reward because of your faithfulness and doing it with the right heart. That heart there's nothing in heaven for you because you're wanting it now. I want the glory now. I want the reward now. And God says, okay, that's what you want. If, if hearing from a few people how wonderful you are, the same people that next year are going to say how bad you are <laughs> because you'll never be as good as they say you are and you'll never be as bad as they will say that you are. But if that's what you want for your reward, go for it. I'd rather you just Serve with a right heart, gospel humility, not worry about that junk. And when you come to heaven, receive your reward. Amen. What's the takeaway? Humility is glad that God gets all the credit for choosing us so that we boast only in him and not man. Humility is happily it's, or happily admits that everything we have is a free gift from God so that we can't boast in it. Humility is glad to affirm that God sovereignly governs our heartbeats and safe arrivals or non-arrivals. The root of Christian humility is the gospel that Christ died for our sins. That's how sinful I was. That's how dependent I now am on God. Humility gives itself away in serving everyone rather than seeking to be served. Humility is glad to affirm that this service is true greatness. If God does a work in your heart through humility, friends, you come into an experience of freedom like any, unlike anything you've ever had. Without humility, we won't serve or we'll serve with the wrong motives. You gotta have gospel humility to serve. And we're gonna go around the tables in just a few moments and you wanna approach those tables with that spirit in mind. That's who Christ has created you to be, a worshiper of God through serving. So you're looking at these and you're praying and you're praying for the ministries and then you're also letting the Spirit of God illuminate your heart and say, hey, maybe this is where you want to get involved. Maybe you need to be part of a men's ministry. Maybe you need to be part of an ushering, a welcoming team. Maybe you need to be part of something, putting up signs before services where nobody sees you, just out by yourself on your own doing it and you're not getting any credit for it and nobody's coming up to you but that's where God wants you to you go where God leads out of a gospel humility amen I want you to I want you to see just the ramifications of humility in serving none of the great virtues would flow to us if we didn't have gospel humility faith would anyone depend on Christ as a needy weak and sinful person if Christ hadn't come to this world in humility what about worship? Would anyone really believe in God and care if Christ 
uh, care to worship Christ if Christ hadn't come in humility? Obedience. Would anyone freely surrender his life and submit to the absolute authority of Scripture if Christ never submitted to Scripture himself in humility? What about love? Would anyone seek the good of others at a cost, especially a greater cost to himself, if God hadn't made the ultimate sacrifice by sending Christ to die for us? See, it all flows out of gospel humility. Everything, every good thing in the Christian life grows in the soil of humility. Without humility, every virtue and every grace would just wither away. And for some people who serve with a wrong spirit, that's what's happened. They're not joyful. They're not enjoying it. They're, the, the fruit has withered. You want to come into it. And if maybe you're serving and you're losing that, you can come back to it. Remind yourself who you are. I'm created to, to, to serve. And it's out of gospel humility that I serve and regain that joy and that freedom. That's what you get when you walk in humility. You're, you're set free to laugh. You can laugh at yourself. How many of you make mistakes and you can't laugh at yourself? Or somebody else laughs when you mess up and you're like mad at that person for laughing. That's all about pride. You do understand that. When you mess up, and I do it from time to time, I'll never forget a few years ago, election year, and Obama was running for president. And I said to the congregation, not knowing what I was saying, in my mind I'm thinking, okay, look, the reality is it's a pretty easy answer. You got one guy who believes, who's pro-life, who is going to stand, who, who fears God, the other doesn't. And I said, it's a black and white issue. That was not what I wanted to say that for that reason, but that's what I said. Somebody after, they were, people were laughing, and I was going, what are they laughing about? That's, this is serious stuff, you know, the election coming up. After the service, someone walks up, pastor, do you know what you said? What, what did I say? Because I know I've said some doozies over the years. What did I say? They said, you said it's a black and white issue. Oh! I felt I just was grieved in my spirit, and then we just laughed together. What can I do, you know? Oh. And there's been times I've just said silly things and just laugh. When, you're, when you walk in, in the times when I don't laugh, pride. Pride. Gospel humility will set you free. Amen? How about this? When you walk in humility, you move from self-confidence to God-confidence. Now it's, it's not about what you think you can do. Now it's about trusting in what God can do. My confidence is in God. Here's another one. When you walk in humility, you no longer need to drive the ego with ambition. I'm not driven by my ego. Ambition, every first of the year, everybody's like wanting to be so ambitious. Ambitious can be sinful because it's about you getting what you want. Why not start out with, Lord, what do you want to do this year? What's, what are you up to? What do you have planned for me? I just want to join you in it. Let me, let me come alongside and let's, whatever I can do, Lord, to, to follow your leadership in my life. That's what I want. Whole different approach. Now the ego takes a back seat to God. Amen? Your marriage in trouble? Why don't you lay down your ego? Why don't you just say, Lord, what do you want for this marriage? Uh, forget about what I think and what I'm upset about and what I think will fix the marriage. You don't have a clue what would fix the marriage. Not compared to what God knows. God knows you inside and out. He knows your spouse inside and out. You want your marriage fixed. You want to turn to God. You want to just say, Lord, forget about what I think. And you know, here's what God will do. If you'll, if you'll open yourself to God and say, Holy Spirit, show me what to fix this marriage. What do we got to do, Lord, to fix this marriage? And you're thinking in your mind, if she'll just do this. If he, will, if he can get her to change this way, then we'll have a better. And, and, the, and the Lord's saying to you, he's saying, okay, you, you really want to fix it? Yeah, yeah, Lord. What do, what do you want to do? He goes, okay. Let, let's, let's go out the back door of your life and take a look at your backyard. Well, I mean, come on now, Lord. I mean, oh, yeah. Let me just work on you. See, a humble person will not bow up to that. They'll say, Lord, in gospel humility, I'm nothing without you. My salvation is all you. I thank you. Lord, fix our marriage. What do you want to say to me? Say whatever you need to say. You won't offend me. 
because I know that if this marriage has ever been good or if it ever will be good, it'll be good because we are following you. And whether she chooses to follow you or not doesn't matter. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to get it right. I'll get in my backyard and go to work. You show me what I need to do. You think God can fix that marriage? Amen? See, but there's the rub. We're more filled with pride and ambition and ego than we think. And you cannot serve in God's church with a right heart and a right reason without gospel humility. I want you to just sit there as we close our time tonight, uh, this, this morning. And I want to I pray. And we're just going to play, uh, Brenton will just play something for us. I want to invite the uh, elders and the prayer ministry team to come up. And by the way, the prayer ministry team is starting to organize. If you have a heart for prayer and you'd like to be part of a prayer min a ministry, they're going to start meeting on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock at the church office and praying. And so just show up at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning at our church office and you can be part of that. They'd love to have you. While they've come up, I just want to, and, and if a couple of you can maybe come over to this side and balance this out a little bit. Thank you. Um, we're just going to open ourselves to the Lord right now. It's one thing to hear a sermon about humility. It's another thing to practice humility. Amen? Here's what it looks like when you practice humility. Right now, we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the areas in our heart that need to be honed, that need to be humbled. Now, here's the good news. God would rather not humble you. He actually says, humble yourself. Humble yourself. He wants you to do it. And so, whatever it might be, a marriage, it might be a work situation, it might be a, a physical sickness, some of us are so prideful, we won't even come forward to let somebody pray for us. Shame on us. God is offering to us by the Holy Spirit an opportunity to be loved, to, to be connected to others who love us and who also are filled with the Spirit who want to pray for us. Let's respond today.